So, good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Montreal. Um, as you already heard, the theme of this meeting is um, from drawing board to uh, sky, and I just wanted to start off by uh, reminding people that James Webb has been around a very long time. And this is a napkin sketch, an idea uh, from the John Mather, Pierre Belly, and Peter Stockman were looking at it at a spy meeting many, many years ago. It was actually sometime in the mid-90s. And so this is how JWST started out, on napkins, not on a drawing board. Around 2000, when we got all the approvals to go ahead and we got our um, prime contractor on board, this is what JWST looked like. So this was our kind of drawing board uh, telescope. It's not that different from what we have today, but you can see that it had 36 mirror segments and it was actually a bit larger. It was an eight meter telescope, but it still had the same architecture, you know, telescope looking at the sky, no tube, and then a sun shield and a spacecraft bus. So this is where we are today, and what I'm going to talk about this morning is just to try and give you a snapshot of where we are on our road to uh, you know, first science and try and explain to you, you know, the progress we've made and also, more importantly, what, the, what we still have to do, the big challenges we have ahead, and then how we actually get the telescope to orbit and start our first science. Now, most of you probably have seen JWST and have heard about it, but I put in a real quick chart here just to remind people how JWST works. It's a six and a half meter infrared telescope, and it's designed to be passively cooled because we wanted a facility observatory that would last hopefully, you know, 10, 10 or so years. And so in order to do that, you have to move away from using liquid cryogen. So JWST uses an array of five membranes, each about the size of a tennis court. And the idea is that they keep the telescope in the shade. So on the cold side, you see the telescope and its science instruments. And they're shielded from the sun by these membranes. And then on the hot side, you have the usual you know, spacecraft bus, the communications antenna, or the usual sort of housekeeping stuff you need to fly a, a satellite. And the basic idea is that you always keep the hot side facing the sun, which means you can see you know, 35% of the sky at any given time, and then over the course of a year, you can get full sky coverage. And of course, we also have a continuous viewing zone at the close to the ecliptic poles where you can view all the time. So that's the basic architecture of this telescope. The science that this telescope was built to uh, undertake has not changed, but it's certainly evolved. And the really uh, motivation or motivating science that JWST was built to do was the, um, trying to identify the very first galaxies that formed in the universe, what we call the first light problem, and then to study reionization, and then over the history of the uh, universe, understand how galaxies have assembled and evolved over that um, epoch. We also have uh, science goals or science themes that are closer to our own um, solar system in our own galaxy, so we want to look in a star-forming region, study the birth of stars and protoplanetary systems, understand how um, protoplanetary systems are born and how they evolve and what kind of environments they form in. And then finally, what I think will be one of the uh, killer apps for JWST that really wasn't appreciated back in 2000 when we were just getting started uh, with the field of exoplanet science using transit uh, observations is planetary systems and the origin of life. And in this theme, we'll study both our own solar system, but also uh, planets around other stars. And we have direct imaging capabilities, but we also have a really powerful capability to do transit spectroscopy. And I think this will be one of the most memorable science areas for JWST when people look back in 20 years and say, what have we achieved? So, I'm not going to put up lots of charts with text on them because they're hard to read, but I just wanted to walk you through how we get there with the JWST instrument complement. So we have a deep wide field imager, the near cam instrument, which is built at the University of Arizona, and that does uh, our first light science for us, very deep wide field imaging over the one to five micron band pass. It also is the instrument that allows us to phase our telescope, and uniquely, the engineering capabilities that we designed to phase the telescope will also be some of the most powerful uh, instrumentation now for doing transit spectroscopy. So they've evolved into dual-use capabilities. 
And then we also have direct uh, high contrast imaging using coronagraphs. The European instrument uh, contributed by the European Space Agency, NearSpec, is a multi-object uh, spectrograph. It's designed to follow up those first light detections, allow us to study about 100 objects at a time so we can really leverage the power of that spectrograph. It also has an integral field unit spectrograph for studying individual objects in detail. And we also have uh, long stick capabilities, and these have been enhanced in the last couple of years so that we can do a really good job uh, with uh, exoplanets. The MIRI instrument is a collaboration between a European consortium and uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab. It's a mid-infrared um, imager, images from 5 to 29 microns, and gives us um, mid-infrared imaging, integral field unit spectroscopy, and it also has a very powerful coronagraphic technique. And then finally, the Canadian Space Agency is contributing the fine guidance sensor and this instrument allows us to measure the jitter in our images and correct that jitter. And it also provides some science capabilities, including near IR imaging, some um, high contrast imaging using a very different approach, closure face masks. And then it also has a very interesting uh, slitless uh, spectroscopic capability that defocuses the images in one axis so that you can do transit uh, imaging of very bright objects. So that's what our instruments look like. Uh, this is what they look like today. These instruments have all been built, assembled, tested at their home institutions, and then shipped to Goddard. And these instruments are currently all located at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, you can see each of them in the uh, panels here. I'll just focus on a couple of uh, Near cam is kind of like a sandwich instrument. It's actually two independent optical benches. Uh, the benches are beryllium and they're sandwiched together. The near spec instrument is actually a silicon carbide optical bench and also uses silicon carbide um, optics. And then the other two instruments, the MIRI and the FGS, are primarily aluminum. So those instruments have been delivered and they've also been integrated. So we have an incremental test program on JWST where we start at the lowest level and we work up at successive levels of integration. So what you're seeing here is the integrated science instrument module that we all call ISIM. And this is uh, basically ready to test. It's got all four instruments installed, so you can see uh, each of the instruments there labeled. And this is uh, how it looked several weeks ago as it was sitting in the clean room at Goddard. And what we're doing um, next is we integrate the ISIM and its instruments with this big unit here you see, which is called the Integrated Electronics Compartment, and that carries all the electronics for those instruments. And then on top, you can see the radiator that connects those instruments to the uh, electronics um, mounted on top called the harness radiator. So this is our science instrument package, and what we're doing right now is we're testing this package at the Goddard Space Flight Center, and this is a picture of ISIM uh, being installed into one of our large chambers called the SES. And you can see a bunch of guys there as it's lowered into the chamber. So this is a real um, moment when you have to hold your breath as you see this massive piece of hardware swinging across the um, ceiling of the got a space flight sensor and then being lowered into this chamber uh, ready to be installed for the test. The chamber is actually pretty large. It looks like this, so this gives you some idea of the scale. And the ISIM mounts on the top, and then underneath we have uh, what's called the OSIM, which is essentially a JWST simulator. So we're doing three tests of ISIM with this hardware. We've already done the first one where we just ran ISIM with two flight instruments, mainly as a checkout for all of the uh, hardware in the test facility, what we call our ground support equipment. And we're just, as we speak, starting to pump down for the first test at cryogenic temperatures around 40 Kelvin with all four science instruments in. So this is the first integrated uh, science instrument thermal vacuum test at temperature. We will do this test for the next couple of months, you know, check things like alignment, make sure the instruments are properly calibrated, and then we'll bring it back up to temperature then the ISIM unit will go and do all of the environmentals that you have to do, you know, shake, that kind of thing. And then it will come back and we will repeat this test to make sure that nothing has changed. So that's where we are with the uh, science instruments right now. Uh, another 
essentially a year or more of testing to get them to the point where they're ready to deliver to the next level of integration on the telescope. So let me move on now to the observatory. The heart of the observatory is the telescope, and the heart of the telescope, of course, are the mirrors. So we have 18 primary mirror segments. They're made of beryllium because this is a cryogenic telescope, and they have to operate at 40 Kelvin and be uh, stable at 40 Kelvin. What you see here is one of, the, um, one of the telescope mirrors being unpacked. This is a flight mirror. And when they come in, they're inspected, and then we pack them away. So you can see behind a uh, bell jar here. This is the uh, jar that we ship these uh, mirrors everywhere in, and we also store them in there. So these mirrors are just fantastic. They all meet their requirements. We're meeting our primary uh, mirror um, composite wavefront error requirement. And we're also meeting the requirements for the secondary mirror, and then the rest of the optical train, the tertiary, and the fine steering mirror. So all of the mirrors are, are looking really good. This is how we store them. This is at Ball Aerospace before these mirrors were shipped. And uh, it, we, I kind of think of these mirrors as being like, you know, grandma silver. You only get it out on special occasions. And, you know, we keep these mirrors covered because we don't want fallout on them. We want to keep them absolutely spotless. And so they will sit in these nitrogen purged vessels right up until the moment we're ready to install them. And then as they're installed, we actually have covers that go on them to continue to prevent fallout. So we're not going to have too many pretty pictures of beautiful gold mirrors as we integrate. I thought I'd just show you this one as well. This is the secondary mirror. And just to give you some idea of the sense of scale for JWST, this is about the same size as the Spitzer telescope. So we're talking about a really large gain in capability here. Now, all these mirrors have to be mounted on something that will keep them stable, and we put them on something we call the primary mirror backplane. This is a composite structure that uh, both mounts the instruments on one side, so the top part of that structure is called the back, backplane support frame, and it holds the, the front of the uh, frame with the mirrors, and then the ISIM, or the instrument module, actually mounts inside that. So what you're seeing here is the center section, of the back plane and then the back, back part of the back plane that mounts the in integrated instrument module. So this is uh, being tested at the Marshall Space Flight Center. It was cryo-tested last year. It's now at uh, Northrop Grumman where they're giving it um, load testing to make sure that um, everything looks good and then it will be delivered later on. So this is the, um, the center part of the back plane but of course this is a deployable telescope so the primary mirror actually folds up and we have two wings, each which mount three mirrors. And you can see the primary mirror back plane for the wings uh, here. There are two guys working on the one in the foreground and the other one is in the background. Just to give you some idea of how precise these composite structures are, each of these um, units weighed about 50 kilograms and there was a five gram difference in weight between the two of them. So, you know, the. ATK do a really good job of building these to very precise specifications and keeping all those bond joints really um, controlled. Now, we also built a second back plane, and this one we call the Pathfinder. Now, we've only built the center section, and we only built the part that mounts the mirrors. And the basic idea here is to follow a philosophy that we followed on this program for the whole uh, program and that is to try to get uh, a jump on each test before we get to it by checking out all the hardware and using a real piece of hardware to actually get some measurements to make sure that we're not fooling ourselves or that we understand how to do the measurements. So we did that with the mirrors. We had a mirror that ran ahead of the uh, fabrication schedule so that we could solve problems that popped up as they happened and get the flight mirrors uh, back in shape and kept on schedule. And this is the uh, Pathfinder. It's a center section back plane with a secondary mirror mount and the secondary mirror struts. And this uh, piece of hardware will basically run through uh, telescope integration and the cryo-optical test that we do at the Johnson Space Flight Center ahead of the main flight hardware. That way we can uh, get smart about how we integrate the mirrors onto the back plane and we can also then get very smart about how we do this test and check out all of the test hardware on a real piece of um, flight-like uh, equipment, as you can see. 
Just a word on how we integrate the telescope. So next, around next April, we'll take delivery of that flight back plane, and we have a big facility at Goddard uh, where we mount that back plane facing the ceiling, and then we have a robotic arm that allows us to lower each of these mirrors into place and then lock it onto the uh, back plane. So this is the robotic arm uh, being tested with a flight spare mirror, just showing it, in integrating that mirror onto a a subsection of uh, backplane that we used early on in the program. And that's how the system will look. So we actually disconnect part of the secondary mirror strut so that we can fold it back in order to have access to the mirrors. And then finally, the, the sort of uh, last two parts of the observatory are the spacecraft, which also includes the sun shield. So we had a big milestone this year. We passed our critical design review for the spacecraft and uh, we're now uh, clear to finish a completion of the spacecraft design. Uh, on the left there, you can see two different views of the spacecraft. It basically is the box with all the flight electronics, reaction wheels, but on this telescope, it also has two, two sets of propulsion systems, one for station keeping so that we can stay in L2 orbit, and it also has another set of um, propulsion systems that allow us to do momentum unloads on orbit because the solar pressure on those sun shields actually means that we are continually having to work against them with the reaction wheels, and every few days we have to unload that momentum by doing a burn. And of course, these thrusters are also used to do our initial orbit insertion as well. The solar array is a single tail dragger configuration. That's the blue thing at the back pointing up. And then the flat panels are uh, actually radiator shades so that the bottom of the sun shield isn't doesn't have a view to the radiators on the spacecraft bus. Now, that's what this looks like. It looks like a box, but actually the heart of this spacecraft bus is a composite cone, which you can see on the right, and everything else is built up around that cone, and all of the panels you see in the di diagrams on the left are actually uh, instrument panels that mount onto this cone. So this cone is the main load-bearing um, piece of hardware in the telescope takes the load for the whole um, payload once it's integrated. And then finally, the sun shields. So in the last year, we built five uh, flight-like membranes. We call them template membranes. And the big issue with these membranes is to understand their shape once they've been fully tensioned. And so each of these membranes that we built, and each layer is different, has been put on this big stand at Mantec in Huntsville. We uh, tensioned the membrane up, as you can see here, and then we actually measure the shape using LIDAR and correlate that with our finite element models to make sure we understand where these sun shield layers are actually going to be once they're deployed, because the separation between the layers is critical to the thermal performance of the telescope. So this, I think, is uh, sun shield layer three under tension, and you can see a guy standing there looking at it. Uh, it gives you some kind of idea of the scale. The um, Sunshield itself is actually made of panels, so it's kind of, when you go to Mantec and you look through the clean room window, it's kind of like you know, Cinderella's dress being sewn together. You see all these guys running around with these massive gauze, you know, stitching them together on these molds. So it's kind of cool. And once we get uh, these template membranes to Northrop, we also have to test them. Now I'm going to come back and show you some more of this testing uh, shortly. But the basic idea is that the sun shield membranes have to be folded up for launch and then they have to deploy after we launch. So these panels you see here are called UPSs or pallet structures and these are the pieces of hardware that we fold the membranes onto. So Northrop have built a full scale deployment facility here and this is where we test deploying the sun shield and understanding how all that hardware is gonna work together. And I'll show you how that works uh, shortly. So the last big thing we have to do before launch is the end-to-end -end optical test of the whole package, which is the telescope and the science instruments. And we will do that at uh, Chamber A at the Johnson Space Flight Center. This is a picture of what Chamber A looks like today. We've completely refurbished it, added helium shrouds. There are big uh, isolators mounted in the ceiling now. You can see a couple of people standing there for scale, and you can also see the rails that we've added to move the payload into the uh, chamber. So we've basically cleaned this place up quite a bit, but I did want to point out that this 
chamber was originally built for the Apollo program. There's kind of a nice link there because James Webb, who this telescope is named after, was really the father of the Apollo program. So it's a nice piece of synergy there. So this is one of the Apollo uh, command modules being tested in chamber A. And again, that gives you some idea of the scale. We're not planning to send astronauts into the chamber this time, though. And this is what it looks like inside. So this schematic just gives you some idea of how this is going to work. The telescope will actually be suspended from the ceiling because we want to isolate it from uh, disturbances. So there are six big isolators on the roof of this chamber that actually suspend the telescope. And then it's um, held at the bottom by this hard point offloader, a big composite structure you can see. All of the measurements we do inside are either interferometric, done with this big box on the left called COCO, which has a number of different uh, interferometers, or by um, just direct metrology. And I've got a picture there of some of the uh, cryogenic photogrammetry booms that we've put in. So we'll be doing measurements of the location of all the optics as well. So this will be one of the largest tests that's ever been done on a cryogenic uh, piece of hardware. And uh, it's going to be very challenging. And so that's why we're going to run the Pathfinder with its, uh, that single piece of the back plane with just two flight spare mirrors and a flight spare secondary through here first to make sure that we check out all of this hardware in advance of the actual test. So what I'm going to do now is just you know, give you an overview. The, our road to launch looks like this. So this year, one of the key focuses or areas that we've had to deal with is manufacturing the spacecraft, which, as I said, includes the sun shield. We started the beginning of the year by passing our CDR for the spacecraft, and now we're busy putting together the spacecraft hardware. You saw the cone. Next year, the big event will be the telescope integration. So um, around April next year, we will take delivery of the back plane. It will get mounted in that big uh, fixture at Goddard, and we will start putting those mirrors into the telescope and building up our telescope. In 2016, we do something that's called observatory assembly, and that covers a lot of things, but one of the big events will be mating the telescope to the science instruments so that we have our package ready to send down to Johnson for testing in 2017. But we'll also be building uh, the SunShield hardware as well and uh, finishing up the integration of the SunShield with the spacecraft bus. And then in 2017, we have a really busy year running this uh, test at Johnson. And I should mention, we have one test scheduled uh, for this flight hardware in the Johnson chamber. So again, that's another reason why we really are focused on getting a Pathfinder test done first so that we really can be very efficient and get in and out of this chamber takes a long time to pump down, you know, almost a month and another month to come back up to temperature. So it's a very complex test and needs a lot of choreography. And then finally, in 2018, we finish integrating the telescope with the spacecraft and the sun shield. All of that goes through environmentals, and then it gets put on a boat and goes down to Kourou, where the European Space Agency will give us our ride on an Ariane 5 to, um, to launch. So what I wanted to do now was just show you our deployment sequence. And we have a lot of deployments to do after launch. So this just runs through how that works and also has a few pieces of um, hardware in, interspersed to show you how things work. So first thing out is the uh, solar array. Then we do our first burn for orbit insertion. Each of these movements is actually a real attitude change. Then we deploy our antennas. So we can start talking to the world. And we do a second uh, orbit adjustment. And at this point, we're already past the moon. And this is when we begin the sun shield deployment. So first of all, we do two pallet um, deployments, the fore and then the aft pallet come down. And again, I just wanted to show you, this is what those pallets look like on the mock-up at uh, Northrop Grumman. And this is just stowing one of these pallets back into place. And you can actually see that all of the sunshield layers are actually folded up and uh, pinned to the uh, pallet uh, as they will be for launch. So this is what they look like. The uh, thing on the right, sort of photobombing this video, is our third scale sunshield. And this was used to check that we understood the thermal models for the telescope. So next big thing on the deployment is uh, the tower. We lift the telescope off of the spacecraft bus. 
And then we have covers that have to be removed from the sun shield because it needs to be protected at launch. And then the big event is pulling out these booms that pull out the five layers of the sun shield. And we do one side and then the other. And this is uh, a video that just shows you Northrop uh, starting their sun shield testing. And this is the first test of pulling out uh, five of these sun shield layers on one side of the uh, telescope. So all of these deployments are being tested on the ground as much as we can, either at the subsystem level or then at the full scale level. Once the layers are out, we need to then just tension the membrane, and that's done using cables. And the momentum flap is just to balance the center of gravity. And then we come to the big um, optical deployments. So first one is the secondary mirror deployment. And this video shows you our pathfinder, again with that secondary mirror strut. And this is actually a power deployment as it will be done on orbit. And this is obviously a speeded up movie. So the deployment actually goes pretty quickly, but then it takes uh, quite a while for the final phase where the thing actually has to uh, latch itself into place. So that is um, how it will work on the real flight hardware. So it was pretty impressive for everybody that works on this program to see all this stuff start to come together and see these pieces of hardware demonstrate each of these key deployment areas. So then we uh, deploy our RF radiator on the ISIM and we finish up the OTE deployment with the uh, wings which are also uh, motored into place and then latched down. And at the end of um, 29 days we do a second uh, burn just to get us into the <coughs> L2 halo orbit. So many thanks to Northrop Grumman and John Ehrenberg for putting that uh, video together. So I want to just summarize by saying that you know, JWST will do really transformational science and it will change our view of the universe. We're still on track for um, a launch in 2018. And as you can see, we're making a lot of progress with the hardware. Everything is coming together according to schedule, according to the plan. And we're getting all the testing done that we need to do especially in some of these areas um, that are relevant to the deployment, as you just saw, but also the big optical tests as well. So I just want to finish up by saying that um, you know, this is the work of a very large team, um, NASA, ESA, Canadian Space Agency, our contractors, uh, Northrop Grumman, our prime contractor, Ball Aerospace, ATK. So a very large number of people contributed to the success here and they're going to keep it going uh, to get us to our first light uh, on orbit in 2018. And if you're interested in following um, JWST, we have a pl plethora of um, social media. But um, the interesting one, I think, if, if you want to follow how things are evolving over the next couple of years, is the webcam. We have two webcams in the uh, clean room at Goddard, and you can from next year actually watch the uh, telescope being put together one mirror at a time as that robotic arm drops each mirror into its slot. So that's going to be a really uh, interesting activity. And of course, we have our Pathfinder coming to Goddard on, in the middle of July. And we'll be doing a dry run of that integration by putting just two flight mirrors on sometime in the August, September timeframe. So if you come back to this web page, you'll be able to follow all this being done in real time. And of course, we have our web pages. Um, we also have an iBook on iTunes now. And if you're interested in how JWST will work for your particular science program, the Space Telescope Institute now has a large number of um, exposure time calculators. So you can do sensitivity calculations. And they also have PSF simulators. And uh, I will finish there. Thank you. <laughs>